have an ultrasound, you're getting surface data and you're trying to infer what's going on underneath. Exploration seismology, it's the same process. You're exploring for hydrocarbons for oil and gas. Um, you're looking under the ground without destructively um, digging everything up to try to determine you know, where the oil and gas reservoirs are. We use either sound waves or electromagnetic waves that we send down into the earth and those will reflect back because of the different media that we have under the earth. And so they reflect back to us, we can listen, and then from what we hear we have to try to find out what was under there. The actual experiment being shown here is an attempt to understand what the subsurface looks like. How do you generate a disturbance like a wave that would propagate into the ground? I have been on seismic experiments where the U.S. Geologic Survey actually dug a big hole in the ground and they put a whole 2,000 pounds of dynamite in that hole and they exploded. Another thing that they do is they hit the ground really hard with a big hammer off the back of a truck and that makes the ground vibrate and causes a, a wave or a disturbance. What we usually do is we start with a guess. So we have an idea, maybe a rough idea of the types of rock that are under the earth. And then computationally, right, in our computer, we send the same waves that we did actually on the earth when we went out and did those experiments. We calculate the whatever we get that we hear back, and we compare this to what we actually heard back when we sent out the waves into the earth and listened to what came back. And from this comparison, we can infer something about how to change our guess about what the different types of rocks are, and then we can update this guess and start the process again. I wanted to move on to hydraulic fracturing, and what you see here is a well, and these are little perforations where pressure is so great that you're creating a flow path, you're creating a fracture in the ground. You cause a big increase in pressure when you inject this water, and, and there's a stress that builds up, and often as a secondary effect, you get little teeny earthquakes, what are called microseismic events. And so what we're interested in is trying to estimate these little microseismic events, these small earthquakes, because we would like to then use those as passive sources to get a handle on what the subsurface looks like. The idea is that those earthquakes can be thought of as passive seismic sources. If you have seismometers set up or geophones, you can then use whatever is going on underground without actively generating those sources to try to get a better picture of the subsurface. We're modeling the Earth and trying to find out the different rocks under there. The problem is the Earth is very big. We don't want to model the whole thing. And so what we'd like to do is put that in a little box and just image what's inside that box, so just the area that we care about. The problem with a box is that waves tend to reflect off of the side of a box and come back in. But in reality, the waves would have kept going uh, off to the sides, you know, off to different places. And so what we need to do is have absorbing walls on our box so that when the waves come and hit the wall, they'll actually be absorbed and they'll disappear as they would have in real life. They're doing all of these things. They're going out and fracturing all these reservoirs. There's all sorts of things going on, but there's so many questions they don't really understand yet. This was brought into bold relief with the Deepwater Horizon offshore Gulf of Mexico disaster, but it's even more so with hydraulic fracturing. They're doing these things, but people don't understand the processes. And so the more we can do simulation on a computer, it's less expensive, it's also less environmentally destructive, and it potentially will help elucidate how these processes are working.